in one space dimension. So in classification of second order partial differential equation, this equation falls into the class of parabolic PDE. Okay. The one we had earlier, the Laplace equation, and they fall into the class called elliptic PDE. And then there is the hyperbolic, and those are wave equations, which we will not touch. Okay. They are somewhat harder, theoretically. So heat equations, so let me um, set the equation up for you. So you think you have a one-dimensional, let's say, a rod, a stick. Okay. Let's say unit length, you can just make a unit length, it doesn't matter. If you say it L, there's annoying number L everywhere. Let's drop that. And you have a heat distribution. So temperature, let's say now U, will be the temperature in this rod, and it changes in time. So it's a function of time, and it's a function of space. Okay, And that's my unknown. And uh, I consider just a unit length. And then here's the heat equation. So the heat here, U here, satisfies this equation. So U sub T, the time derivative, equals to the second derivative in space. I write U x x. Is that okay? Differentiate x twice. Okay? And this holds for, for U inside the domain and for T start to be bigger than zero. Are we okay, Tiffany? Oh, yeah. yeah. Is that okay? And then there is um, initial condition and boundary condition. So you can um, you can think. So I'm going to solve this equation here. This is x. This is t. There is a final computing time where I will stop my computation. And this is from 0 to 1. So that's my stick. And I want to see its temperature in time. So what I will have to solve my domain will be this region, forward in time, how the temperature changes, right? With boundary condition fix, which we will specify, okay? So I will have boundary conditions. So the boundary conditions, we'll look at today only the um, homogeneous, homogeneous Dirichlet. So I'm sorry, there's some scary sounding names. Homogeneous meaning it's zero, Dirichlet means the temperature is fixed at the boundary. So you can imagine you have a stick with certain temperature initially in it, and then what you do, you take some um, ice water mixture and you stick to the two side of it. So at the boundary, it will take temperature zero. Is that right? Please use Celsius. <sighs> I cannot understand Fahrenheit. <laughs> so it's temperature zero, okay? So temperature at the boundary, x equal to 0 is 0. And then temperature at the other boundary, x equals to 1, is 0. And that's fixed for all t bigger than equal to 0, bigger than 0. Okay, Because initially, you have a temperature, and then you change it. All right? OK, so you have initial condition. That is the initial temperature distribution in the rod. <coughs> Say, probably, you stick it in the oven, and it's hot. And then you take it out and put two ice cubes mixture at the side. And you want to see how the temperature changes in here. OK, so initially means t equals to 0. And then your distribution is in x. OK, let's say some function f of x. OK, so for x between 0 and 1. Is that OK? So that's the problem setting. OK. We want to find um, numerical approximations. So the heat equation is almost equally important as the Laplace equation because it's just a time-dependent problem built on top of the Laplace equation, if you see it. Let's say if you waited a long time, and then the heat distribution reached the equilibrium, meaning it does not change in time anymore, so u sub t becomes 0, right? And if you think you are in a two-dimensional situation, then what you have on the right-hand side is the two-dimensional Laplacian. If in 1D, that's the one-dimensional Laplacian, the Laplace operator. So steady time, steady state, when u does not change in t anymore, 
the solution for the heat equation after a long time is the solution for the Laplace equation. Do we see? So this is a Laplace changing in time. Okay, so it's a very important equation. So there are many fine properties. This is very, very much studied. If you have taken 251, and later on if you have taken 412, then you know there is a way of construct formal solution by breaking up the solution into basis functions of periodic functions, orthogonal, so the sine, cosine function. In the end, you can write your solution in the Fourier series. Okay. And anyone taking 251? Remember that? Matt? I did 250. Only 250? You missed all the fun. No. <laughs> <laughs> but we don't need that. So what, what we want to do now is just a way of constructing numerical solutions. So I need to make a grid. Okay, so I need to think two layers. One is the grid in space. On the interval from 0 to 1, we always put a um, uniform grid here. Okay, so let's say I have m, fixed m, that's m is fixed, and then I have a grid size. Let's use delta x too, so it's clear where it comes from. So 1 over m is my grid size in x, and then I have xj, which would equal to uh, j times delta x, uniform. Okay. And then are we to do space also, time step. So let's let delta t be the step size. So you just move forward in time. And then you will have a t n, let's put n under, will be um, n times delta t. So n from 0, 1, 2, all the way until you reach the final computing time, then you stop. Is that okay? So what we will be doing is still similar to um, the other problem. So let's say I have a final computing time. And let's say I, I cut into four grids in the x direction, and then I cut it into some grid in the t direction. So what I will be computing will be approximate solutions only at the grid points. Okay? Nothing in between. Discrete values. Is that clear? Okay. So we compute discrete values, which I call u, with index j in space, and in time I call it m. I put it up to mean that's time. Don't get tangled in the space down here. They're separate. This is approximation to the exact solution at tn at xj. Is that OK? All right. So we'll be talking about three different methods, all based on finite difference. So the first one we will throw in is the, um, the simplest one, the, um, an explicit time step, explicit method. Okay, so what we do is a forward Euler step in time forward Euler time step. Okay. So you know you just need to find some approximation to the time derivative and the space derivative, right? So fix a point at a point t n x j. I'll be looking for the derivative. So u sub t is approximated by the value of t at tn plus 1 in the future, forward, right? So this will be the u at n plus 1, that's the 1 in the future, at j minus the u at n, j divided by delta t. That's the forward final difference. Is that okay? And then in space, that's the normal one, the central final difference. So u n j minus 1, 2, u, and j, u, and j plus 1 over delta x squared. Is that okay? And then we will plug these two back into the heat equation and write out. So plug into heat equation. 
so basically you will have this equals to that is that right because that's my equation I normalized and I put a coefficient to be one here there could be a constant that's the heat conduct factor okay which we just take one doesn't change the behavior okay so if we plug into it um, and uh, okay let me do that let me be, don't be lazy and just write it so u m plus one minus u n at j over delta t equals to u n j minus one to u n j u n j plus one over delta x square that's my scheme isn't it i want to write it in a somewhat nicer way so i can multiply both sides by delta t so this delta t comes up here and it's over this delta x and that parameter is in front of everybody so i'll write it i'll write it as one letter so gamma will be delta t over delta x square is that okay makes it a bit more compact so we just have gamma multiply all over here and the, the with this so i can write out i can clean up a little bit i can write u n plus one j mm -hmm. because that's the next step value that's what i want to compute and what i'm already being given is the u value at n for all j that's given i'm trying to compute the next iteration okay. so i would move everything has something to do with n to the right hand side because those are data now at this step okay so if i do that i see this term move to the right will join that term because everybody is multiplied by gamma there. So I will have gamma times u and j minus one, mm -hmm. plus this one move over, give me a one minus, I'll have two gamma, u and j plus gamma, u and j plus one. Is that okay? That's your iteration. So let's call this star. This is kind of a important so what are the j values i can go through let's specify since j minus one and j plus one appears in here so i cannot take the j all the way to the boundary can i then you will have information outside so the j will have to go through the inner points one two all the way to m minus one is that right and then u at zero its initial data is given so n can run from zero one two and all the way until your final computing time is that okay so let's set up initial condition and boundary condition as well so initial condition the discrete version of it what does it become it becomes u zero at j these will be all given so you know your initial condition is just some function f so this will be f evaluated at x j j from 0 1 2 to m so you set that all up okay and then you also have boundary condition because you see if u 0 is given i can plug into star setting n equals to zero and i can compute u at time one for all the inner point j from one to m minus one but not the two boundary why i don't need to compute the two boundary because i have boundary condition they're given is that clear so boundary condition tells me u has zero for any n shall be zero you just fill in there Okay, and then u n on the right, these are zero for n equals to one, two, and so on. Now you see the iteration is well defined. You can take as many steps as you want. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, so. Now, we're not going to do error analysis here. We'll just intuitively argue. So 
For the time derivative, I fit in something um, that's one-sided Euler step. So this is a first order approximation. And for the space, I have a second order approximation, right? This is different from ODE, time dependent, okay? Those will be the order of your methods, okay? So the method combined is of order order let's say so in time it's first order in space is second order okay all right so I'm going to give you something called the computational stencil okay this will not be that extensively used as the Laplace equation. It's just a nice way of seeing things. So, you know, at level t equals to n, so at level n, I need, look at the equation star, you would need three numbers at j, j minus 1, and j plus 1. So let's say this is u, j at n, this is u, j minus 1 n and this is u j plus 1 n. I need these three values together it will make me compute the u at j but the next time step n plus 1. Is that right? So you see in order to compute one number here you need to open up like a triangle backward in time to include three points. If you change any three of these, one of these three, you will change the value u. Okay. So it kind of gives you a visual picture of how um, a value in the future depends on the value in the past, I mean in time step. So you can imagine this one would depend on something open up in a triangle below it, and this one would depend on something open up in a triangle behind it, right? So if you trace all the way back to u t0, then you see you have a big triangle. It will cover many, many possibly grid points. Any of them changed a little bit will affect the value in the future. So you see a nice called dependence of domain of dependence. Okay. But nothing more than that. It's just nice to see. Okay, so that is the algorithm just per se. You can set it up and you can run. But you need to be a little bit smarter than that. You need to know, does it converge? If I take delta t equal to zero, delta x goes to zero, will this method gener generate um, stable approximation to the exact solution? Will the properties of the exact solution of the heat equation be preserved by my numerical approximation? Okay. So there is a little bit of analysis I wish to introduce to you. Okay. So for the heat equation, well, it has many fine properties, but there is a very important property. It's called the maximum principle. Any of us have heard of it, maximum principle? Anywhere else in any connection? Mm -hmm. Any comments? What's maximum principle? It's a very strong principle to state. So I will state it in connection with the initial condition that we have there, boundary condition. Okay? If you have different initial or boundary condition, it might take a slightly different form. Okay? So what it says is that, okay, let's consider two time. You have a T1 and you have a T2. T2 is the future, T1 is in the past. If that is given, then the exact solution of the heat equation satisfies the following. The solution at a later time anywhere in the domain x is bounded above by the maximum of the solution of u at an earlier time you can maximum in space so let me call this y so y is between 0 and 1 in this example 
okay? And is bounded below by the minimum of it. It's just taken y, y in the domain. And if your solution U shall not be a constant in space, you actually have strictly, strictly less than or equal to. So what it says is that um, this operator, second derivative, if it's involved with a time derivative on the left, this is called a diffusion operator. So what it does is that if initially you have some heat distribution not equal to zero, and then if you plug this into the heat equation, what the equation does is it will kill all the oscillation. It will try to diffuse and smear out everything which is what we expect from heat behavior. Is that right? So if you have your heat initially distributed like this, what it will do? Well, after time, this will move up, this will move down, and this will move down. You will have something that oscillates less. And then after a little bit of time, this will move further down. You have something that oscillates even less. And as time goes to infinity, your temperature shall be zero asymptotically. Okay? That's what it says. It's strictly being smoothed out. Okay. You can write this in a slightly different way. It makes it easier for us to verify it in the numerical method. Okay, so I can rewrite this. So this would imply also the following. Since I'm fixing the two boundary condition at zero, this means if I take absolute value of u, then the max of this absolute value will just go down in time. Does that make sense? So this will imply the following. Then I can only look at the max. I don't need to look at the mean. And I take the absolute value of u at t1 y, right, over y, will be less than the maximum of u. Um, absolute value t2 y over y. Okay. If t1, um, now I messed up, this is t2 and this is t1. At a later time, the maximum is decreasing. Okay. If t2 is bigger than t1. Okay. So I'm going to write out so we want this to be preserved by the discrete case. So I can write out what would it be for the discrete maximum principle. What does it mean? So now I have just a set of data on the grid. So I want this kind of a maximum principle to be preserved. If I can make sure at every iteration the maximum is non-increasing, then that's good. Right? So I will have the following maximum over all j's of the absolute value of u n plus 1 j shall be less than equal to the maximum over all j of u n j. Okay? And this holds for all n. Then you know it's decreasing. So what do you think? The explicit method, the forward Euler time step, do you think it will preserve this maximum principle in the discrete case unconditionally? Or there shall be some condition? Mm -hmm. What do you think? From experience, just guess. In the past, we have talked about explicit method. They are simple to compute, but usually comes with the price of having some stability condition. Is that right? So you should expect the same thing here. That's usually the case. Okay. So what we will do now will be, um, this will be presented to you like a a sufficient condition. So if I have this condition, which I will state, then we can show the discrete maximum principle will hold. 
right so that makes this a sufficient condition but in the end this is also a necessary condition we will not go through that proof okay so this is called CFL stability condition okay so I think this is current Friedrich and Louis <laughs> CFL okay so I will give you the condition is given and then we go and verify right so this will be sufficient so right now it's presented as sufficient actually it's necessary if it fails there's no convergence okay it's really needed okay so the condition is the following I will have the following kind of a theorem which will prove so if now um, do we have the definition of my gamma somewhere this gamma gamma is important so if now um, I assume the following, that is, in this iteration, on the right-hand side, these three coefficients in front of this u, if I assume that they are all positive, okay? That's my assumption. So this is positive, no problem. This is positive, no problem. But this guy is not always positive, depending on your choice of gamma. Gamma is delta t and delta x, okay? So if I assume that, which means 1 minus 2 gamma is bigger than equal to 0. I assume that. Okay. So what does it mean? This gives me a constraint on gamma, isn't it? So gamma has to be less than or equal to half. Is that right? And then this will work. So what is gamma? Let's put plug in the gamma. Gamma is delta t over delta x squared. And that shall be less than that right? So if this holds, then I can show this will lead to the discrete maximum principle. That will hold. So we'll go through this little proof. So make sure you understand this proof. Make sure you can repeat it. It's not a bad proof. It's very simple. Okay, so we want to show that the numerical approximation generated by this algorithm star here, bless you, will have this maximum principle. So everything is in absolute value. So I'll start by taking absolute value on both sides of this equation star. Is that okay? So what do I have on the left? absolute value u m plus 1 j right it would equal to the absolute value on the right hand side and I see on the right hand side I have three terms I can use the triangle inequality take absolute value of each and add up I get something bigger is that okay triangle inequality so I have um, I take out the gamma because it's positive u and j minus 1 plus 1 minus 2 gamma, I can take it out because it's positive, u and j, absolute value, plus, okay, gamma times u and j plus 1, okay? I can pull out these three numbers from the absolute value sign because of my CFL condition this guy is positive and that's actually very important for the argument okay so I have inequality now I'm going to make the right hand side even bigger so I'm adding a specific index j minus 1 for this u at time step n if I replace this absolute value sign here with the one where this un reaches its maximum for any choice of j, I get something bigger. Is that clear? So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to replace this guy with the maximum of un, let's say, i, as I go through all index i. Then I get something bigger, right? Agree? And I'm going to replace this one also with that. So 1 minus 2 gamma of maximum over i of u and 
high because I replaced this with the biggest it can have for any index down here. That one is bigger. Okay, and I do the same thing for the last guy. So gamma times max i of u and i. Then I have the correct inequality. This is bigger than what I had in the previous step. Okay? So now we see I have a negative 2 gamma times that guy, and I have a gamma times that guy, and a gamma times that guy. Those three terms just cancel out. Do we see? All I left on the right hand side is one term, which is the maximum of u and i over index i. Agree? I could do this because I assume this is positive, then I can pull it outside the absolute value sign. That step is important, very important. Okay, so let's see what we have and what we can conclude from there. Okay, so let me write out. So I have proved the following. I have this. I know that u and plus 1 for some index j, for any index j, is bounded by the maximum of u and i over i. So this will be a specific number. And on the left-hand side is a number with the index j. This inequality holds for all j, j from 1 to all the way to m minus 1. Is that right? And the boundary condition is 0, conveniently. So if this inequality holds for all j, then it holds also for that particular j where this thing reaches its max. Agree? That's the only tricky thing here. If this thing holds for any j, so there will be a j where this expression reaches its maximum. At that j, this still holds, right? So I have the following max over j of u and plus 1j must be less than that guy. I can just change it into j. It's just the index. I call it i earlier not to cause confusion. Isn't that exactly the discrete maximum principle? Mm -hmm. So we have proved the discrete max principle. So under the condition, the stability CFL condition, then we show this. Then you know the maximum will be non-increasing in time step, which is a property of the exact solution. Okay. So let's take a close look at this condition, the stability condition that we discovered. So it says that um, delta t over delta x squared shall be less than half. So you can view it in the end as a restriction to the size of the time step you can take. Do we see? If I rewrite this, this gives me delta t shall be less than equal to a half times delta x squared. Is that right? Once you picked a discretization in space, you had a delta x, then the condition says your delta t has to be sufficiently small, isn't it? Has to be smaller than that. So would you like to comment on that condition? Do you think it's a convenient condition or it's an annoying condition? Think you want think you are a professional simulator, you're doing some industrial skill simulation, you have to take small steps to have sufficient accuracy, right? Say delta x is 10 to the negative 3. What time step will you force to take <laughs> if you want to reach one unit of time? Delta t will be a half 
10 to the negative 6. You'll be forced to take 2 million steps. Isn't that annoying? It's not very pleasant, isn't it? That's very annoying, isn't it? So you realize that this is actually a very strict condition on time step delta t, especially when that's normal case when delta x is sufficiently small, which you want to have. And then you'll be forced to take so small steps and takes many, 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 many iterations. Okay? Because we show this as a sufficient condition. I could make a remark here that this is also a necessary condition. Doesn't take much to show that if this fails, the discrete maximum uh, principle will fail. Mm -hmm. If you're curious, take a closer look and see if you can come up with an argument. It's not that hard. Right. Okay, so you'll be forced to take so many little time steps and very irritating if you want to get away with this. What do you think you should do? Mm -hmm. Just think of um, what we have done. In the past, we ran into something a little bit similar, right? Say the stiff system. You are forced to take very small time steps if you do explicit. Then what did we do to go around that? We turn from explicit into implicit. Is that right? So let's take a look at implicit method. I'll just set it up. Next time we'll look at it. It's stability. So implicit Euler step, meaning a backward Euler time step. Okay? So now the time derivative is not taken from present and using the future information. You'll be using the past. So let me write it out for you. It's obvious what it does. So u n plus 1 j minus u n j over delta t. This is the um, derivative in t. And I think I am approximating the derivative at tm plus 1. So I'm using backward. Is that clear? That means the space derivative here shall be evaluated at m plus 1 to make this implicit. Okay. So you will have u m plus 1 j minus 1 minus 2 u m plus 1 j plus delta x squared. Okay. Comparing this to the explicit one, these are m plus 1 instead of m. Is it clear the difference? That makes the whole world of difference. Now, at your time step, u and j's are given for any j value. And you are trying to find u m plus 1 for any j value, right? <coughs> This equation contains three unknowns. Do we see? All these three are unknown at the time step. You end up with a system of linear equations. Is that clear? So let me introduce this notation again. This gamma, I'll rewrite it. So let's write gamma <coughs> as delta t over delta x squared. Okay, I'll keep all the unknown on the left and move the known, which is this only guy, alone, throw him on the right hand, right hand side. Okay, So the left hand side will be gamma times this coming over. I get negative gamma um plus 1, j minus 1, plus, and then I have 1, and I have 2 gamma, so it's 1 plus 2 gamma of um plus 1, j. And then j plus 1 is a negative gamma um plus 1, j plus 1 equals 2. And this only guy is moved to the um, right hand side. Mm -hmm. So for each fixed n, I have this j running from 1 to all the way to m minus 1. So what kind of a linear system do I have here with this equation? You see you have m minus 1 equation. So let's set up the linear system, and then we'll stop. 
We have seen this many, many times. We always end up with this locally related problem. So you have a matrix, and you have the unknown vector, and you have the right-hand side. Mm -hmm. Your unknown vector are all these u's, u m plus 1, 1, u m plus 1, 2, all the way to u m plus 1, m minus 1, right? Those are your unknowns right now. And the right-hand side now is u n 1, u n 2. This is given u n of m minus 1. And look at the left-hand side. For each equation, it contains three terms, which means three elements in a row of an A matrix will be non-zero. Which three would they be? We've seen this so many times. Come on, guys, you know. Where does this guy go to? The J's equation, the J's element, it has to be on the diagonal. So this becomes tri-diagonal. Is that right? So on the diagonal is 1 plus 2 gamma, 1 plus 2 gamma, all the way down to 1 plus 2 gamma. And the upper diagonal is negative gamma, negative gamma, negative gamma. The lower diagonal is negative gamma, all the way to negative gamma. Is that right? And then you know the first equation would actually touch u0 which we have a boundary condition. You move to the right-hand side, you actually are adding plus gamma times zero, but it's zero. But you know you actually added that. Because it's zero, you didn't have to do it, right? And for the last equation, well, there's the other boundary condition at um, which is zero, so you move to the right-hand side, you're actually plusing gamma times zero. So if I change the problem and put different temperature at the two end point, so the boundary condition is not zero, then you will have some terms here. Is that clear? OK, so look at the system here. It's tridiagonal. Is it diagonal dominant? We always look for that. Is it? Is the diagonal big? Is it bigger than the sum of all the rest? It's gamma smaller than yeah. Yeah, but if gamma is big, I have plus two gamma. Do I need to worry? <laughs> Take, you add up the rest, you get two gamma. The diagonal is two gamma, add a one. It's even bigger, right? So, okay, so you can solve Gaussian with Gaussian elimination very efficiently, no pivoting. But no matter what, you still have to solve a linear system. So this is a disadvantage, okay? Even though it's okay. So each step, you have to solve a tri-diagonal system. Even though it can be done efficiently, but comparing to the explicit method, every step you just need to add a couple numbers. This involves a lot more work. Okay, but all that hard work comes as a reward in the end that we can remove that annoying stability condition, which you have to wait next time.